What? Yeah. No, I'm... Yeah, I'm behaving myself. I'm, no, I'm not playing in abandoned buildings. What? Again? Now. I suppose you had those people follow me again. Fine. Hey, this is Jimmy Farrell from Monty and the Farrell, and I want to thank all our subscribers. We have now passed 14,000 on our YouTube channel, but I want to ask our subscribers to take the next step for us and become a full-fledged member of Monty and the Farrell. Yeah, that's right, folks. There's three different levels to choose from. There's free shirts. There's free autographs. Just check it out and become a member of Long Island's number one pro wrestling broadcast, Monty and the Pharaoh. Later. Hello, this is Mick Foley with a deep concern about our uh, 2022 midterm elections. I do not like to get political on social media. That's part of the reason why I left Twitter. It uh, got to feeling like I was dodging turds in what had once been uh, a sparkling clean swimming pool. And at a certain point, it's no longer fun to swim in that murky water and it's time to get out. Uh, so you will not hear from me politically for a while to come, but I am deeply concerned about these 2022 elections. Look, it's an old wrestling joke that back in the days when we used to be asked about the F word more frequently, talking about the fake word, you would say, well, yeah, the matches I lose are fake, but the ones I win are real. Meant to be a joke, but now it's become the policy of hundreds of people, literally hundreds of people, running uh, in this midterm election from the highest offices, uh, governors, senators, uh, congressional representatives, to the, the secretaries of state and people running for school board and things of that nature. I don't want to tell you who to vote for, but I will tell you who I think you should not vote for, and that's anyone who's expressed the belief that the 2020 elections were fraudulent, or uh, the conspiracy theorists. Uh, look, democracy really is on the ballot this year. I understand inflation, and I don't like spending exorbitant amounts of money for a, you know, a quarter pounder with cheese and, and fries. But these prices are going to come down. That's what inflation does. It runs in cycles. The last time it was this high is when Ronald Reagan was president. He turned out to be one of the most popular presidents of all time. Inflation uh, decreased greatly, and it's going to decrease greatly here. Gas prices are going to go down. But once democracy is dead, it's not coming back. And so I urge you, with democracy hanging by a thread, not to elect people holding the scissors. Uh, it's a difficult time in America, and I think you should treat it as such. Cast your vote wisely. But please do vote and have a nice day. All right, welcome back to Long Island's No One Pro Wrestler Broadcast. Monty DeFaro, only seen here out of Indie Music TV, straight out of Ron Kakaba. We want to thank the great Mick Foley uh, for weighing in uh, a day late after the election. But, you know, we thought we should play his video. First, I want to thank Mick Foley. He does a lot of kind things for the kids. And he reads the Christmas stories. And he dresses up as Santa Claus. Wait, wait for it. But... <laughs> The one thing I don't want is to hear any political advice from fucking Mick Foley. Okay, first of all, what I don't believe in is if you're a millionaire, buy some fucking teeth. That's the first thing I'm going to open Who's up Who's his with dentist? Dude, seriously. Don't tell me Britt Baker. Is, I'm going to be really upset. <laughs> the guy's a millionaire, right? Yeah, get some teeth. Can you get some teeth? Yeah. Get some nice, And if you're going to do it, if you're going to ask people to be responsible right. in their voting... Mm -hmm. Put some teeth in your mouth. Yeah. 
What do you think? That would be good. I could I could understand his sentences even more clear. And he doesn't want to tell anybody who to vote for. Right. But don't vote for anybody that uses the F word. And I'm not right. going to say the F word because no. we'll get suspended right. yet we again. Right, we don't want to be in trouble. But I find it hilarious, though, that you can have the opinion that it absolutely wasn't the F word. Right. That's okay. But if you dare think that it may not have been how he subscribes to it, you could get in trouble. You can't. You have to think like. And I ask you, is that democracy, Mister? I need a new pair of teeth. Or maybe that's not democracy. He's off Twitter because he doesn't want to talk about politics anymore. Or maybe he just doesn't like Elon Musk. Oh, you right. You, you maybe maybe because he doesn't want to have to pay for his blue check mark hmm. that people pay him for. Interesting. And how about the fact? I love how he says he's not going to tweet anymore. I'll just throw out a video to get my two cents in. Either way, you're doing it. Well, well, one other thing. I guess he has less aggravation because he can make the video and not read the replies. One other thing, Farrell, you, you need to weigh in on. Oh, God. Go ahead. He's worried about democracy. Yeah, so am I. But if anyone knows, so am I. when Mick Foley does these signings, mm -hmm. he gets paid like $10,000. That, to me, would be capitalism. Sure sounds like it. Major capitalism. But doesn't don't it? vote. Aren't you the guy that has the scissors, Mick Foley? Mm. I think so. Because I know plenty of people that pay you ten thousand dollars to do their virtual signings. Mm. So again, selectively Foley, righteous. Select. He speaks with four selectively tongue. righteous. Yes, yes, yes. Mm. I like that. You know, I the, like the, that. You know, the F word may apply here after all. Selectively RJ righteous. RJ says too many chair shots that have really hurt Mick. I, Phil I, says it, give us facts, Mick. Yeah. Check out. Dinesh Amen, Phil. Yeah. work. Still mm -hmm. working us, please. Mm. Again, yeah, holding that... the scissors. He speaks with forked tongue and no teeth. <laughs> Man who speaks with forked <laughs> tongue and no teeth. The great Mick hey, Foley. you think that they'll throw in a tongue with the new teeth? Maybe a new tongue. Oh, no, but maybe Mick can do some <laughs> signings for us fans, us yeah. wrestling fans, right. for free. Why? Because you're all Whoa, about that's the... the F word. Don't you ever mention that F word around Mick Foley ever again. That's right. You're right. Yeah. Have but, a nice day. But but don't let but don't <laughs> let me tell you how to vote. No, of course not. Because I'm I'll, Mick Foley. I'll just subliminally suggest. Aren't I slick? Aren't I slick? Yeah. Too many uh, tosses off the top of a cage. I guess these things happen. These things what happen. Else, what else you got? These things happen. You know. These things happen. Yeah. What else you got? Hold on. I'm what coming. else you got? Just oh, relax. I hope you don't have what I think oh, is Oh, yes. I was. I told you uh, you had this opportunity. Here we Nike's go. Nike's relationship with Kyrie Irving likely over, Phil Knight says. A relationship between the Brooklyn Nets guard Kyrie Irving and Nike is likely severed for good. The shoe giant's co-founder told CNBC... I would doubt that we'd go back, co-founder Phil Knight said in the interview. How many of the times is this article going to say Phil yeah, Knight? Yeah, Phil Knight. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. What does he do by day, Mr. Knight? Go ahead. <laughs> go but ahead. I don't know for sure. <laughs> Nike announced last Friday that it has suspended its relationship with Irving and canceled his plans to release his next signature shoe. Wow. Because that's I another could. guy. I, yeah. That's another guy yeah. that needs more money. Right. And the world ain't right. Capitalistic piggies. Farrow. Yeah. Have fun. It's yeah, all have, you, have fun. all the way. Well, let's see. Well, you know the reason why. The reason why they don't want to do anything further with him is because of a uh, massive fallout following his tweeting a link to a film containing anti-Semitic material. The Nets have also suspended Irving for at least five games. Well, you know what? You are a fucking racist, Kyrie Irving, and I don't think just because. Unfortunately, you know, being a, being a black man, you get to deal with a lot of bullshit that you shouldn't have to, but that doesn't give you a free pass to be a fucking racist, okay? You are charmed, my friend. You might have had some talent. You know how to bounce a basketball. You're pretty good at bouncing it. Okay, congratulations. You have been paid millions of dollars. You never show up for your team. You are the worst teammate I've ever seen, and on top of it, you're an anti-Semitic? Oh, you like to hate Jews, huh? Oh, okay, that's good. And I got news for you. For the NBA, if you do not kick him the fuck out of the league, I will never, ever pay for another ticket to see one of your games again. Well done. Sickening. Well what done. Is with the, what is with the double standard? And by the Get way, this motherfucker out of the fucking league. We do have the job man on, so I know we're going a little bit along yeah, with it. There's a sorry. lot to say. 
So I'm sorry, I've got, guys. No, I'm I've sorry got, about got, the language. I'm sorry, but that is just I've got, absolute I've, hatred on parade. I've got something, Fuck that. I've got something to say now. Hit it. So Can I sit back? Hit it. Sit back. Yeah. So nice. We had a wrestler okay. by the name of Wolfie D. Arr! Wolfie D was in our studio. <laughs> And then Wolfie yeah. was mm-hmm. so impressed by our show, and he said, ah, I'd love to do a show. I could do this. So we're record. like, okay, we gave him the whole semantics. Yeah. Get you some sponsors, get sure. paid, have a good time. Hey. And Jamie Dundee, his former partner right. from PG-13, sure. contacted me because he was pissed off about all the things that Wolfie had said about him. Okay. So Jamie came on and gave a great interview. Yes, he Wonderful did. Wonderful man. Yeah. And... At yeah, that point, did. Wolfie's been trying to reach – me and Wolfie had a falling out because Wolfie, after taking sponsor money, and I'm going to say this flat out clear, yeah. he decides he doesn't want to do show anymore. Right. So I said, that's not the right way to do business, Wolfie. You're mm. the one that wanted sponsors, no. and we got your sponsors, and you decide to do your little audio podcast. You take the money, and you run. So whatever. So we okay. were done with it. Goodbye, right. Wolfie. You're done. Gotcha. So as far as I knew, Jamie and Wolfie did not get along. Well, recently, and guys should tune in to In Co- Living Color. It's the Wolfie D podcast. Okay. He had Jamie Dundee on, and they mentioned the whole elephant in the room with what went on with the show for the numerous months that everybody, I think, is aware of because right. they tune in. Right. Our loyal listeners and friends and family. Of course. That's on this list. Love JB, you, RJ, the First Absolutely. Lady, Phil, Little Patty, the list goes on and on. For sure. So they don't mention the show. Okay. And oh, that then, was the, that but was now nice. Jamie's got the itch. You just gave them a, for a cheap pop. They can't mention us? Oh, whatever. What, what are they, spraying their tongues to say the words Monty and the Pharaoh? Uh, well, it's not, not painful? So Jamie's got the itch to get back into it. So now rumor has it they're going to tour. Okay. And okay, okay. Um, rumor hmm. has it that these two may be entering the great studio of indie music TV hmm. and face off against Monty Nefaro. So I want to make face something off? clear. <laughs> Here's the deal. Okay. Face Wolfie, off. because Wolfie already told the agent that he does want nothing to do with me because he doesn't want me to rip him apart on studio. So <laughs> be prepared, Wolfie, if you have the balls to come in here and wear a shirt because you look like a fucking idiot. <laughs> Okay, um, and let's be, let's be real honest, oh, Wolfie. Boy. You were mm. nothing in the wrestling industry. Let's get it factual, okay? I'm not stopping you. Go you ahead. happen to live in the South, and in the South, you know, it's just like marrying your sister. <laughs> Wait a you minute. became a wrestler. Okay. You know, who knows? Maybe you blew Bill Dundee. I don't know. I probably licked oh. his, or you know, gave him you oh. know tossed his salad. Man. Bill, I want to be a wrestler. Toss my salad. There you go. I'm going to do that for you. Chapstick anybody? So anyway, if you come in here. We're going to shred you. We are going to shred you. We're going to call you on all your bullshit and all the secrets we know about you, Wolfie D. Because the reason I'm bringing this up is because Wolfie D lied about me. And I caught wind about it, and I didn't like it. And I'm not going to tell All I'm saying, Wolfie, if you have the balls come in here, we're going to shred you. And we're going to tell the world the truth. And I'll just leave it at this. I have all the texts, Wolfie. From many people, and I will read them on air, because I don't like you, Warren. I don't like you anymore, Warren. Who names that son Warren when the last name is Wolf? Warren Wolf. Hi, I'm Warren Wolf. Anyway, so I got that off my back. Oh, and uh, bottoms up. <laughs> to the right is the start of the show, Mr. Jimmy Farrow. Jimmy Farrow along with his partner, bottoms Bart up. Griggs. Make up the band with Stereo Hall. With Stereo Hall sings such great songs as In My Dreams, This Life, <clears throat> Not Far Behind, and the Monty Nefaro theme, theme song, Riding High. But man! Please catch with Stereo Hall's music on Reverb Nation, Spotify, Apple Music. You didn't know it. This is the Monty and the Pharaoh show seen by over 2 million people. Oh, Facebook they know it. Live. They know it. Monty and the Pharaoh page, YouTube, Monty and the Pharaoh page. Hear us on iHeartRadio. Hear us on Spotify, Anchor, catch us, us on Twitch TV, Channel 15 every Tuesday uh, in New York at 9.30 and Saturday at 11. Oh, that's the wrong information. <laughs> I don't know what the hell the I did. Uh, unbelievable. Times. We'll be We're right back with the job man, one of the great wrestling legends, his second time on the show. Always great to see him and hear him, Chris Moltier. See you in an enhanced second. You like oh, how you, I did that? I like that. Enhanced. Like that. Yeah, we'll be right but back. But he doesn't want to be called enhanced. No. I just Why didn't you say see you in a job second? 
Uh, I don't know. Doesn't really sound right. It doesn't yeah. sound right. I like uh, how I did it. Well, I wonder what Chris is going to say. I'm not, I wonder what he's going to say about all these things: Mick Foley, Kyrie Irving, Wolfie D. He, he might not. He might know. He might know Wolfie D. He probably pinned him. We'll see you in a second. You need a body shop. You need engine repair. Auto Excellence Collision Specialists. Six three one two six one six four two zero. That's six three one two six one. Six four two zero auto excellence. That's right, folks. Canine Corral for all your dog daycare and overnight care. Call six three one five four nine fifteen forty four. That's six three one five four nine fifteen forty four. Jimmy, I gotta take a dump. What? No. I mean, I need a dumpster. <sighs> well, for all those needs, you need to call Big V Dumpster Rental, Long Island, New York, 631-900-DUMP. Hmm. All right, welcome back to Long Island's number one pro wrestling broadcast, Monty DeFaro, seen only here out of Indie Music TV. We want to welcome the job man, Mr. Chris Moltier. How you doing, buddy? Hey, guys. I, I hope up? you're easy on me tonight. I was getting a little scared there. You guys are venting pretty good. <laughs> you what? You you weren't. We. I don't even know how to say this. I didn't want to put you in a spot, but it's 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 crazy tonight. So that's okay. Chris, Mick Foley. Thoughts on Mick Foley and his political views, Chris? I hate to put you on a spot, but what are your thoughts? Well, you know, if he didn't like to, you know talk about his political views and voting and so then he shouldn't have done it just you know just don't talk about wrestling and you know who cares what what he thinks or 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 whatever and you know his views and stuff and like you said the guy's he's a millionaire and um what does he got to worry about he doesn't have to worry about anything they don't have shit to worry I mean, about do you really want to take advice if a guy gets thrown from a top of a cage? It's like, and and I got to be honest with Mick. Um, he I think the funny line that, you had. What's that? Was when you said he talks with a forked tongue, but he doesn't have any teeth. <laughs> you, don't have any teeth. <laughs> you got. I, I mean, I was dying over here. I mean, you guys were when you guys get into it together it's absolutely a great comedy show i just enjoy it oh, i appreciate Wait a minute, that chris. we're being serious thank you chris thank you <laughs> yeah. that's, the, that's, the, that's the funniest part about the whole thing chris you know and then those two with... guys are, what is it wolfie d and that other guy i mean they look like they got title belts made out of hubcaps now did you look i know you're an old school guy with that wrestled some of the greatest legends yeah. of all time yeah. so i probably wouldn't expect you to know him but did you ever hear of pg-13 did i it was he a wrestler they were a tag team <laughs> is he a, it's a PG well, i guess i, I, I guess the answer is no. I, I know there's That's movies funny. that are rated that but i didn't know there was wrestlers <laughs> that were rated that <laughs> Oh, my God. Oh, my I mean, God, I mean, wake up at 2 in the morning to think I'm going to come up with a stupid name like that? Well, Jamie must Dun be 14 you know, years old. You know Bill Dundee, right? <coughs> yeah, I know who he is. He's about five foot tall. <laughs> You'd squash him like a grape. You know, he was a great little worker, and he was a good okay. booker. Um, him, and, him and Lawler had some great matches against uh, each other. He's thinking about his father. But what uh, did... It, Jamie isn't is one of his kids a wrestler. Yeah, that's, Jam yeah Jamie. That's so Jamie's other, part of PG thirteen. That's the other half of the hubcap tag team champions. <laughs> yeah, the hubcap tag team champion. <laughs> what, <laughs> what the one guy looks like uh, Buff Bagwell's. Or he stole like uh, he stole uh, the Grinch's hat or something like wow. that. Ooh. Man, yeah. well, yeah. The one guy needs to go to the gym. The guy with the hat on. <laughs> Take steroids, or I mean, these guys look like a total of two hundred and fifty pounds together. Ooh, yeah. Where's George Saharian when you need him with those roids? George anyway. Saharian. Yeah, where is he? He's, oh my he's God. the medicine man. He's the candy man. If he can't do it, no one can. Come on, you know the deal. <laughs> oh is, boy. Like, come on, Chris. What is it that makes a pro wrestler decide every, everybody want, out there must want to hear my political opinion? Maybe I'll talk about religion. What is it? Why? <laughs> I don't know. Because you guys are you're entertaining. 
Yeah, but what makes you the talk wrestler about him himself? Mean, mean your opinion or or uh, yeah, the, what makes it as you being a former professional wrestler? What do you think of when a wrestler decides, "Hey, my opinion on politics is so important that I've just got to make it public." <clears throat> he thinks he can get away with it because he's got um, he's well known, and nobody cares about what you know what what he says, and nobody would care about what I said, and it's you know we don't come on here to talk about that kind of stuff we we come on here to talk about our wrestling experiences and and that kind of stuff and and uh, that's what people want to hear they don't want to hear about their personal you know their their political views and and what about this and and these candidates and stuff like that you know what Just keep that stuff to yourself or talk to your wife about it but i don't want to hear it well and you guys don't either Foley's wife's so embarrassed by the way he looks all the time, she's never in the picture. So she probably can't talk to him. I mean, seriously, the guy grows a beard 10 feet long, he has no teeth in his mouth. He's hot. <laughs> <laughs> I can't anymore. He ain't oh, as boy. hot as Dutch Mantel, I'll tell you that much. Uh, oh! <laughs> if you ask me one more question, Rabbit, I'm a not answering. Is Hi, that somebody say? Hi, I'm Dutch Mantel, and I know everything about everything. And all the truths are hiding right here in my beard. He, he's a guy that you would want to slip him a Mickey, and while he's sleeping, shave half his face. Oh. And so he's got one half yeah. mustache, and the other one is completely shaved off. Because it, it's like, really, get rid of that stuff. You're disgusting. <laughs> and half his back. Oh. oh. <laughs> What is this, George Steele? What the hell's going on here? Oh, all right. oh my lord! All right, enough making fun. Yeah, he's got right. more hair on his back than uh, Andre had on his head. Ooh. Oh my god! Damn. Oh my lord! Oh my, my finger! Hey, my name's anyway. Dutch Mantel, and I could tell you how to build a rocket ship. He could. Yeah, he was there. He sounds like Earl Scheib used to. <laughs> oh my god. Uh, <laughs> should we move on to some wrestling questions? Yes, Maybe? please. Maybe. Okay. Chris, it's been uh, it's been 25 years since the Montreal screw job. First, I'd like to get your thoughts on that. Considering you were professional, no matter no matter what the decision was going to be beforehand, you you followed what they asked you to do. So, thoughts on the screw job from Montreal involving Hart and Michaels? And uh, although the answer might be obvious, uh, who would you take in a uh, real scrap? Oh, the Bret Hart. Bret that Hart and a real one. Yep, that makes sense. Um, you know, here's the thing. Th this this business is is uh, pretend. It's not real. It is. And so what if he would have lost the title in, uh, what was it, Toronto or wherever they were at? Right, in Canada. Um, Montreal. You know, it, what was it? oh, it was Montreal. Oh, I'm right. sorry. I, it, I apologize. Which but, screw job yeah, was it's this? Like, Let me remember. <laughs> yeah, yeah be right. One. Might be someone not even aware of. I'm so of. flustered by uh, Mick Foley and Dutch, and you can't get past the fork tongue and, and the hubcap twins. But uh, the hubcap twins. <laughs> oh my god. But uh, oh boy. If if you had to lose, so what? He right. would have probably got it back or right. or whatever. I mean, he yeah. got paid a, a big ton of money, mm. and. Anybody who, in, in I mean, I never had a problem losing, and I did it for 20-some years. So <laughs> so what if he had to lose in Canada? Who cares? You know, they would have worked something out to come back again. Did we lose you? You there? No, he's still there. All I'm right. still here. Did you, let me but ask yeah, you this: think, Do you think this? Did you think that screw job was set up, or do you think it was real? Um, it was set up. I'm, I'm sure Vince did something right at the very end and said, "Okay." Uh, he told, uh, I don't know, it was a referee, Hebner, Earl yeah, Hebner, right. Dave Hebner, told him to, <clears throat> excuse me, um, when he puts him in that sharpshooter, ring the bell right away. Because um, there's no way he would have given up like that. So he would have had you, to go on longer. Do, and so you and, don't think uh, Hart really knew what was going on? It was just this. I don't think scheme. he did. No, and I don't think and I don't think uh, Michaels knew either. 
I think I think it was a complete surprise. I I I suppose there's different versions of what people think, but for whatever reason, I'm sure um, you know it would be like a complete surprise to both of them. I was in a match um, one time with Greg Gagne in Rockford, Illinois, and he had me in like a like a straight arm bar with his legs, and I would get up and I pull him by the trunks, and I almost had him pinned, but I had to throw myself off. And I had to tell the referee finally, I said, man, I got his trunks because I could have pinned him. And what are they going to do? You know, so, and that wouldn't have been planned. It would have, if I would have done that, I would have been done. But I really believe that Vince pulled the very last, um, he pulled the, the rug underneath him, from underneath him. And um, I don't know why he did it. But for whatever reason, he did it. Um, so I, I think it was it was all Vince and nobody else. What Maybe the, Pat Patterson. Okay. What was the uh, biggest uproar you've ever seen in your career behind the scenes regarding a booking? Did you ever see anybody go, there's no way I'm putting this fucking um, guy over? Or... I, I'm trying to think. It would be... I never really saw anything too much. I, I remember one time, uh, I think the biggest thing that somebody got ticked off at, Honky Tonk Man was wrestling this job guy from Kansas City. We were in Madison, Wisconsin, and the guy kept screwing up Honky's finish, you know, the shake, rattle, and roll, and he screwed it up, and <laughs> Honky. Honky ended up landing on his own ass twice, and the guy was still standing there. So finally, Honky hooked him and really, you know, brought him down hard. And then he went. They went to the back. Kurt Henning and, and other. We were just dying back there, and, and Honky started slapping the guy around, and and uh, he was really ticked off. But uh, I, I never really saw, you know, backstage fights or or anything like that. So, yeah. Hey, Chris, Even at house get... shows, when I was at house shows, nobody really, um, you know, started anything up with anybody. Where did you get your training from? Um, the, there was a guy named Tom Stone. Um, we, there was a little old, it was a old pool room. We had a ring set up and I took the bus down there. I, five days a week, sometimes six days a week. And we trained for three to four hours a day. Um, and I learned everything, learn how to fall, learn how to bump, learn uh, how to run the ropes, uh, how to go over the top ropes, moves, you know, headlock takedowns, arm drags, all that kind of stuff. Did that for like three months. And then after that, we started learning psychology. I never went through Vern's camp. Um, but, and I'm glad I didn't, you know, some guys go through these camps and they get the living shit kicked out of them. Um, which is, there's really no reason for it unless some guy is like really cocky, but you know, you go in there and, uh, you want to learn, you're doing this because that's, this is what you want to do and you want to do it right. And he kind of held, uh, you know, he was the guy that would book us to go do TV or he'd call me if he, hey, they need you for, you know, for to go TV in Minneapolis or Kansas City or St. Louis. And, and, uh, but that's, that's where I got my training. And, um, so I, I, I got in the easy way. Did you meet Vernon, Greg? At what point do you meet them? The first time I went to Minneapolis. In fact, Greg and Brunzel, it was my first match. It was Stone and I against the High Flyers. And then um, Vern was there. And, uh, you know, the weirdest thing, you guys, when you go up there is you got all the heels and all the baby faces, and they're talking to each other. It's just like it, it, it was all real. It was all surreal. It's like, Wow. <laughs> this really does go on and and it's the biggest secret and 
you know, you see um, Ray Stevens talking to Billy Robinson or, or Nick Bockwinkle talking to the crusher and they're whatever. And then Vern's up there and, and uh, then they go out and they do these interviews that they hate each other. And, but meeting Vern for the first time was, was really something else because I grew up watching the AWA when I was a little kid. And, and then, you know, a dozen years later, I'm wrestling for these guys. So, um, they were, they were all pretty decent. Um, Greg was decent. I, I never had a problem with Greg, not one time. And I probably wrestled him more than anybody up there. And I learned, um, but he was, he was super easy in the ring. Love working in. Well, and, since um, you, since you didn't go through that camp, was it hard getting the trust of like a Brunzel or a Ganya because they didn't know you or was it, a conversation you know they, they well they would kind of feel you out you know how how you would take like their arm drags or their you know do a spot how you would sell for them and then once and you know and and doing their finish and once you really because when you're doing tv you're going 100 miles an hour you you put everything you can into it for those six or seven minutes and once you make them look good and you really sell their finish and their moves and stuff like that, it's like, hey, you know what? They they think we're pretty good. And then the the good thing is is that when they keep calling you back, you know, Greg, it was Greg and Vernon Wally Carbo. And those were the top three. And you know, if they if they liked you. Um, and the, and the best part is, is that a lot of, you know, just about, I wouldn't say all the time, but a pretty good amount of time I go up there and they would, you know, Greg would announce, he goes, um, Greg and Curtis, so-and-so and this guy, this guy. And I would get Greg a lot. And I felt that he trusted me, um, that we would have a good match that I wouldn't screw up and, and, uh. You know, it's over a period of time you feel the guy out, and um, so that made me feel real good that that he liked to work me um, more often than not. You know, you, you mentioned Ray Stevens. Now, Farrow and I, you know, we were WWE guys or WWF guys, so we caught Stevens real late in his career. Mm -hmm. But we used to hear how great this guy was, but we really didn't see it. No, we saw the tail end, right? So we, but how great was Ray Stevens in your opinion? His, uh, everybody says he was probably one of the greatest workers ever. I would put up, as far as heels go, I would probably put him and Bobby Heenan almost together. Um, Ray's, the way Ray's timing was, and he, he was an innovator of different things you know like that flip over the top in the in the turnbuckle mm. and just the way he could sell stuff and he made it look so realistic you know when he punched and kicked and everything and and you know when he was doing all that it was like wrestling a a cotton ball he was so light really and his his philosophy is is that you take care of that person um as long as as they're treating you like w with kid gloves and you go out there and you make it look like he's beating the living hell out of you, he's going to take care of you. And, but he was just, he was a great guy. He was one of my mentors when I went up there too. He just, you could ask him a question. He never had an ego. He would tell you what to do. He would watch. Um, he was just, really good when you're breaking into the business um and he never you know he never said hey kid i don't have any time for you right now and and uh so i he he was one of the best he was he was one of the guys that i could really that i really really liked never wrestled him but man he was he was a good guy to talk to i want to i want to hammer this home you mentioned not just Ray Stevens, but you mentioned there's another all time. Oh, I'm great. sorry, Jimmy, I can't hear you. Okay. Uh, you mentioned not just Ray Stevens, but as another all time great villain. I want to make sure we got this clear with the audience at home. In the ring. You're talking about Bobby Heenan, the wrestler, correct? 
Yes. Because I don't think a lot of people really remember, or he's not remembered enough for what he did in the ring as a wrestler because he was an amazing bad guy who got tons of emotion and hatred from he, the fans. <clears throat> when he could do stuff that other guys couldn't do, he he would wrestle like a chicken shit manager. Yeah. And really... <laughs> And just make the other guy look like a million dollars. And he would, he would do stuff. To, I mean, he could, he could make a, a ten year old look like a world champion. He would put himself in positions, and um, uh, in, in different ways that he could be upside down, and just you know off of something real simple. And he knew how to pop that crowd. And he was one of the reasons why I got into wrestling, him and Stevens. Those were the two guys that why I really, really wanted to get into wrestling and be a heel just the way that they sold for the baby face when they made a they made a comeback or just making themselves look, you know, he would make himself look like a, a, a buffoon out there. Right. And he really wasn't. And he was a tough guy, but he just he just played to the audience and yeah it was it was those two guys that i absolutely loved watching chris can you tell the fans about your book where they can get it and what they could expect when they open this book i've read it obviously i could tell you but i think it's better coming from your mouth um <clears throat> what it's about is you know it it goes from my when i became a fan of wrestling when i was like nine years old and i turned it on and you know when you turn on a tv show and you're just like hooked right away that's how i was and then through the years how i would um i would do anything i could to watch wrestling i mean i worked at a restaurant when i was in high school you know some of the stuff i was like I would do like silly stuff and I was obnoxious and it was perfect. My, my personality was perfect to get into wrestling and be a heel and just be a, you know, a, 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 I could be a pain in the ass, you know, in real life and I could be a pain in the ass wrestling. And that's what I really loved. I mean, I worked at a restaurant, like I said, in high school and I lived about a mile away, and I was a dishwasher for a while. I actually had a 12-inch black-and-white TV. Um, I would t ride my bike to work. I would put it on my lap, and I would take it all away. I I'd put it on a couple of milk crates and watch wrestling while I'm in the back running the dishwasher. That's how much I loved it. And then it goes on and on on how how I, um, I got into wrestling. I was a photographer for a while. I, I wanted to do that, become like another Bill Apter. And, um, and then I just got into the business and, and just a lot of the different stories that, um, it, it's the humorous side of the business. You know, it, it's, it's none of my business, you guys, on what these guys do, the other guys that I wrestled or whomever in the, in the dressing room, what they do in their private lives. That's, it's none of my business. Absolutely, because I, I didn't care. It's all about my matches and when I refereed and and the different um, uh, things that happen when when I was in it. And I try to put a humorous spin on it, and I really loved it. I I just I had a blast writing, and there was times I was just laughing my butt off because you know, and that and that's what I hope everybody <clears throat> when they read it they laugh because that's that's what it's all about. I. I, I like, you know, humor and silly stuff. Well, you guys know I love the Three Stooges, so <laughs> that's how I kind of like Certainly. spun it off. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Chris, can you tell us a story when you wrestled the bear? We didn't cover that last time you were here. And wrestled the bear? It's such a good story. Wrestled the bear? Oh, sure. Hey. I was about 20 years old, <clears throat> and they used to have the sports show in Milwaukee every spring. And there was a guy named Tuffy Truesdale. He used to go around to the different territories, and he would bring Victor the bear. He was like a 600-pound black bear. 
and um, he would um, the promoter would have the big time you know the the top heel wrestle Victor and it would sell out all over so he had Victor at the sports show and they were kind of like egging me on hey you should do it you should do it so I signed up for it and needless to say I was scared to death because there's this bear he could probably like you know rip me into kindling but um the next day <clears throat> and I, I I didn't sleep at all that night. I was so nervous. Um, he was out there, and we had to sign a waiver. Like if we got hurt and stuff, it's not it's not Victor's fault. And Tuffy Truesdale, Tuffy used to wrestle down in the Carolinas a lot in the South, and he used to wrestle alligators and and uh, and Victor. He, you know, he put on a show. But um, there was a couple guys that went before me, and um, what they did is they they stood up. And they, you know, they locked up with them, but Victor just took him down and ate him up. But what I did was <clears throat> I locked up with him and then I went toward his waist and then he, he got on top of me, but somehow I was able to get up and I double legged him. You know, if you guys are familiar with, with amateur wrestling, sure. I got him on his back. And when I got him on his back, I hooked the back of his head and then his left front uh paw that's a pool and a he big couldn't pool. get up wow yeah wow. and i had him pinned well tuffy said i didn't have him pinned because um i, I was supposed to grape line grapevine his legs well th that's impossible so if you look in the book you know his legs are up like that and it's it would have been impossible but i had him pinned dead to rights and then um about three four months later there was another bear that came to town and he was at a shopping center and he, they put him in a cage and this dude and this bear was like, I'm going to say, and I'm not exaggerating. He had to be almost seven feet tall, weighed 650, 700 pounds, terrible Teddy. And he just squashed me from behind. And I, I thought I got to get him on his back. And, but he was so big. Then he hooked my left shoulder and he messed up my, I think he messed up my rotator cuff. And um, so that was, those were my, my uh, bear wrestling experiences. But, you know, the, the best part is, you know, people go, oh, I don't believe you wrestled a bear. But there's that picture. There's a picture in a book where I've got Victor pinned. And uh, I was the only one to pin, ever to pin Victor. Then right after that, an animal rights group was all pissed off and so they uh they you know went to the milwaukee board or whatever and said you know they, they really raised hell and they said you know we this is you know inhuman and this is this and it's animal cruelty and we couldn't do anything because we had rules we had to follow we couldn't poke him in the eyes and pull his fur and right. you know stuff like that but that was it for the bear after that he, one i don't think you so. want to poke him in the eyes quite honestly you'd probably really piss him off i'm sorry i said i don't think you want to poke him in the eyes quite honestly you probably really pissed that no bear off, no you know did he, you ever wrestle anybody he, with he bad really teeth and a forked off. tongue <laughs> right no no you, you wouldn't do that why does he was actually better looking the fact than... you beat the bear you beat the bear yeah. nobody else beat the bear tuffy's giving you a heart who is this guy tuffy sucks yeah, Seriously. he was. But, uh, you know, Victor's better looking than um, Mick. <laughs> he's a there you go. better looking. I can't bear Chris, it. Chris, Jason Kessler's asking. Victor had teeth. <laughs> Jason Kessler's asking uh, about <laughs> Rooster Griffin. Rooster Griffin. Oh, God. Uh oh. Rooster Griffin was, uh, was a job guy from Chicago. And how he came up with that name is beyond me. But I think. Rooster had, uh, he had this kind of like, he kind of looked like Foghorn Leghorn <laughs> <laughs> with his hair and it was kind of like spiky and he had a, a mullet and everything and, and, uh, he was terrible. He, we weighed about 190 pounds. He was terrible. And Stone, Tom Stone wrestled him and beat him on TV and, and, uh, but yeah, Rooster Griffin, he, that was a classic one. 
190 Over and let him wrestle. All right. Yeah. Chris, what was your your biggest win, if you had any? When I wrestled uh, Art Washington, this was up in La Crosse, Wisconsin. Um, This is the one where Vince came and, and he got myself and DiBiase and Virgil um and art together and um what the angle was was that dibiase would go you know i'd be in the ring and but dibiase would he demeaned me and he said you know i'm not worth his time i'm a preliminary bum i'm not going to waste my sweat on this guy so i paid somebody to to do my sweat for me and that was art washington and art and i actually drove up to do TV there. <clears throat> so I beat Art in about a minute and a half and then they stomped the crap out of Art, but that was that was my win. Uh, my only win ever um, in the for for uh, New York. And then one time back in I think it was 85, I wrestled Rick Martel when Rick had the strap in the AWA <clears throat> and uh, Stan Hansen interfered. And then Martel jumped out of the ring, and then I got my hand raised because I beat him on a count out. Wow. Uh, wow. That's huge. So those that are probably my two big uh, that's, wins. Was that's that huge. a title match or was that non-title? It was It was a non-title match. Right. But people in the, the audience were yelling, uh, new champ, new champ, and I'm <laughs> putting my hands across the waist like I'm going <laughs> to – like nice. I should get the belt. And, you should. And, uh, you should. It, no. it was pretty cool. <laughs> What's that? I said, you, you should get the belt. No? Jeez. I know. You know what? And what's really funny is around 30 years before that, they used to, on a count out, the guy would lose the title. Right. Really? Those are the old rules. Way back. <sighs> Did not know that. Yeah. Way, way, yeah. way back. Yeah. Yep. Chris, what is it? I just, I'm curious. Being, you know, obviously uh, the jobber, the job man, behind the scenes, are the guys that are above you on the card, let's say you're all at the bar, all of you, and are the guys above you on the card, like, believe in their own hype? Are they dicks to people who are just, as a general rule, that are lower than them on the card? Is it, is it like that? Some of them. <clears throat> Road Warriors were. Road Warriors. Paul Ellering was. Wow. Okay. You know, and here's the crazy thing, you guys. I was in, when I first started out, in the AWA, and, and I'm not afraid to name names because I don't care. Mm-hmm. So what are they going to do? Um, go for it. Try to kick my ass. Go for it. I mean, where do you want to meet? You fought I mean, a bear. A studio, and you know. So, <laughs> <Good luck. laughs> but um, but I wrestled Paul a lot my first year in 1979. Him and uh, Steve Olsonowski, and Paul was a great guy. And then they came to Green Bay. He was managing the Road Warriors. Um, it was a tag, a six man or something like that. I said, Hey Paul, how you doing? He just looked at me and walked away. Wow. And some guys, they, they, their heads get so big. It's like, why? There's no reason for it. You know, I mean, this is, I don't get it. It, it just, they were a few of them. Um, when I went to, when well, can I, first I, went can to I stop WWF, you there one second? Yeah. Give me an interaction between the job man and Hawk and Animal at a bar or wherever else where they just treated disrespectfully. Um <clears throat> Hey guys, how you doing? Um Chris Curtis, I uh you know, I, I wrestled for Vern and you know, I, I you I wrestled, you know, I refereed your match tonight. Um how's it going? I think uh Joe Animal okay. okay would have been he was he was probably um the nicer of the two that's good to hear um so having met him yeah. um the other guy Higstrand Hawk right um he was he was way out there uh with the stuff that he was on and but uh you know it it just I never I never really associated with those guys you know i'm going to tell you the the nicest guys that always stayed really nice even though they they really made it big 
were Hogan and Jesse. They really, they, when we went to New York and then they came in, they would stop and say hi and hey guys, how's it going and stuff because they knew us from the AWA and they, you know, they, you know, they didn't walk by like, you know, their crap didn't stink, but um, those were probably still two of the other decent guys. And you could tell, like when I first went there, my first time I was in the WWF was in Indianapolis. And you could tell how some of these guys there, it was like, this was the big time. And I'm going to have a chip on my shoulder. My ego has gotten five times bigger. And, you know, oh, two other guys that were really decent yet, too, were uh, Shawn Michaels and Marty really? Jannetty. They were still really cool. So, it, you know, and I heard guys had problems with, with Shawn over the years. But, you know, we, we never had a... We never had a problem. But let me. But ask I don't understand. You know, th this business, like I told you guys, this is this is pretend. Th this is kind of like give and take. You know, like you guys give and take with each other. Th that's how you make it. That's how you make a match work. And 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 an angle work. You you got to get along. And because if you don't, you're going to screw it up. You're going to lose money. And just. Get along with each other. It's not hard because the better you get along, the better your match is going to be, and it's just it's just a natural human thing. You get along better, things work out better. Jason Morning's asking, did you ever get a chance to work with Bruiser Brody? Yes, in St. Louis. He Bruiser was um, Frank. What he used to do is. Um, he was scary as hell because he was just so big. But he came up and he said, if if I don't talk to you afterwards, thank you very much. Shook your hand, and then you went out and you did your match, and then you just sold big time for him. And he, he was really easy with me. You know, he was a little stiff, he like was. Stan Hansen, but that's okay. But fr I never had a problem with Frank, you know. Um, another, you know, another time you just go out there, you sell for him. If you don't sell for him, um, then he's going to make you sell whether you like it or not. Mm. And, but no, Frank was never had a problem with him. Being a Did you wrestle the road warriors at all? No. And I'm glad that I didn't because I remember the first time I saw those guys on Atlanta TV. I saw how they just abused people, right? And were just they were totally reckless. And I I, I watched these guys and I said, I'll be damned if I'm ever going to get in a ring with these two. But it wasn't their fault because they were green. Ole Anderson told them to beat the hell out of you know who's ever in there, and even the stars didn't want to wrestle these guys because they they didn't know what they were doing. And um, and then they had you know the the finish that they used too was, um, I think it was, they would set you on their shoulders. They mm -hmm. they pick you up from, you know, from underneath like that, and they'd set you on your shoulder. Yep. And then the one guy came off the top rope and clotheslined you. And what they would do is instead of like going back, right, real easy, um. They took your your legs and they went like that and they jacked you up and you did you know you did a flip you had no control and you would you know land on your face you know or, or on your stomach and stuff and it's like um you had you had no no control and that's how you can get really hurt and they thought it was okay because it looked great but there was no way and 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 even later when they they had more experience i wouldn't have wrestled them i would have said i'm not wrestling these guys no way i got a regular job i got a family i'm not going to go out there and you know end up like a vegetable the rest of my life because of these guys little patty's asking did you work with barry and kendall windham and if so did they have attitudes uh never worked them yeah, I wouldn't Never think worked, you would. Uh, 
Yeah. No, I never, um, I never had a chance to. Barry would have been great. Um, I don't, I, I, I don't think, I don't think Kendall ever went to New York at all. I think he just, he was in WCW for a while in Florida, but um, no, I never had a, I never had a chance to wrestle Barry. We had Ken Patera on uh, last week. Uh, experiences with Ken Patera. I wrestled Ken twice. Wrestled him in the AWA, and I wrestled him in, uh, I think, Cedar Rapids, Iowa, um, for New York. He was easy. Ken took care of me. Um, not a problem with Ken. Um, you know, I remember we talked about our match. You know what we're gonna do? He said he was just real easy, you guys. He said, "Here, I'm just gonna do this, and I'll put you in the, you know, the the neck full right Nelson, now. and I'll swing you around a little bit." And uh, but the, everything else, he was he was a day off. I, I never had a problem with Ken at all. Good guy. Chris, what was it like for you, uh, being AWA alumni, uh, to see uh, a very young? Very talented, you know, fresh out of the uh, the wrestling camp, a uh, Kurt Hennig, turned into a Mr. Perfect, and then leave us too soon. Any thoughts on, you know, memories of Kurt Hennig, watching him ascend, and then watching him leave us way too soon? It, it was really tragic. He was, as far as I was concerned, he was, he was probably, I don't know, I, don't, I can't remember if he was, world champion yes for for the wwf where he was no. just intercontinental champion but intercontinental but we man. know he did in awa yeah he i wrestled him in a tag match him and scott hall they were really easy really just again really easy guys but boy oh boy was he a talent it just and then it's kind of like it's a shock he's gone and um it's it's and, and there's there's too many guys that unfortunately the business took them away. And um, do you think it was stardom so. that led to his getting carried away, or the just the business itself? In other words, all the drugs and uh, yeah. whatever else. It was I the mean, drugs. Okay. Yeah, it was the drugs, Jimmy. Because you know, I know the guys. It, it, it's it's a horrible life. I don't know how some of these guys, you know, especially the schedule that they had, you know, when you're on the road for like 60 days straight, you don't see your family. Um, you know, you get up early in the morning, you got to catch a flight and it's just, it's just, you're a robot. And I guess you need something to, to settle down and to wake up. And then the next thing you know, you're hooked on this stuff and, and, um, the business ate him up, um, kind of like uh, Eddie Guerrero and Benoit and Scott Hall, whoever else. Yeah, you know, Scott these guys Hall. just. Roddy it, Chris, it's it's, it's Phil, a tragedy. Phil DeCesare is asking, "Did you ever have a chance to work with Kevin Kelly, aka Nails?" Ooh, Nails. No, but um, he was another one. He was as he was as stiff as you want to be, because he didn't know how to work. He just went out there and pounded the hell out of you. Nobody ever showed him how to work. You know, um, it's just I got. There's a good story. Um, Tom Stone, the guy who broke me in, mm -hmm. he and Steve Olsonowski, they were in Milwaukee. And Kevin Kelly teamed up with a guy named Steve Regal. And Vern had not smartened up Kevin Kelly. And um, so Kevin was in the ring, and, and, and Tom was saying that he was just so stiff that he had to talk to him like, you know, you, you got to settle down. You're, you're killing me. So, uh, you know, he smartened him up somewhat but he just went out there and and he was just he was rough shot and then i think when he got to be nails that's when he really got loony 
and um, he gained a lot of weight. Um, but yeah, he he was like super strong. I think he was like a he won a couple of tough man contests, and he was an arm wrestler and all that kind of stuff. And so, but thank God I didn't have to wrestle that guy because I lucked out. I was a heel all the time. I didn't have to wrestle some of these, you know, hardcore heel jerks that beat the crap out of you. Let's put you on the hot spot. Yeah. Which guy did you finally name one guy that you said, I don't give a shit. I'll quit. I'll quit wrestling. I'm just going to beat the shit out of him. Cause you, you just disliked him that much. Um, you know what? I never really, it never really came to that point for me. Thank goodness. Oh, you're lucky. You know, um, it 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 never did, and um, there was only yeah. I I, I really couldn't. I, I really couldn't tell you guys honestly that there was a guy where. Um, let's let's turn it I the really other way, Chris. To go and, let's turn huh? it the other way. Let's turn it the other way. Which guy yeah. did you adore the most, and which passing of a wrestler upset you the most? Um, would it be the? I mean, like the, the guy that I. Like who, who who did really you like the most? A lot and then right. and then passed it, away. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm probably gonna say the um, Hubcap twins. Even though I had a rough time with him, uh, <laughs> the Hubcap twins. Billy Robinson. Really? Billy Robinson. Wow. Wait a minute. Yes. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Didn't he do some bullshit to you? He did. That's, but yeah, I really respected I that, him. Yeah. 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 I, I really respected him. And, um, Give him a slap. Respect. But he just, you know, he, he grew to be an old man and stuff. But, um, mm -hmm. um, after that, I, I didn't, I, I didn't hold grudges against anybody. You know, if they were kind of rough with me and stuff, you know, like Bret Hart, when he was stiff with me in the ring, um, you know, it's kind of like, he didn't try to like uh cripple me or anything like that but um i i have to say that nobody really went out of their way to try to really do a job on me to put me in the hospital or anything why was brett so, stiff with you brett hart is always hailed as the excellence of execution mr S mr matt technician why is he being stiff with you what did he do he he claimed that I was a little heavy on a body slam, but you know I could see like I was in a vulnerable position. I was laying on my back, and he dropped. He would come like this. He would come down, and he would sure. put an elbow like right here, and um, and then he would uh, just like really. He was just really laying him in, and. There was no reason for him to do that, and I looked at the and I looked at the the uh, you know the tape, and I I didn't find myself to be heavy or anything like that. But even if you are a little bit, you don't go up all the way, you know. For these guys, you don't have to kill a guy, and um, there was a few other guys that had problems with him too, and he and he really took it out on the job guys for whatever reason. There was a couple other guys that had problems with him too, you know. So when he, you know, when he cries the blues about Bill Goldberg super kicking him in the face, mm -hmm. and he probably caused his stroke. That's bullshit. That never, it didn't cause a stroke. Um, too bad, you know. He's still whining and crying about it. It's like give it up, man. That was probably twenty years ago. Do you think? Do you think he's? Uh, destroying his legacy with all this crying that he does because whenever he has a chance he's got something to say about something i mean even on the tales of the territories right he talks about how vince took over his right. father stampede right. and didn't give him a dime for it right yeah is this uh I, does this hurt 
Bret Hart's legacy because we see it CM Punk is doing. He never shuts up. So he's looking less and less cool minute by minute. Uh, any thoughts on Hart, like, possibly shutting up? Yeah, you know, it's all sour grapes. I, like I don't it. know why Brett's crying about it. He's he's making money, you know, going around doing these signing shows. Oh, is he ever? And Yep. You know, it's it, it, that was a long time ago. I mean, that was, what, 30 when there. Vince took over 38 years ago? Yep. Yep. But But guess what? You were mad at Vince, and then you go back to Vince. And you're right. mad at Vince, and you go back to Vince. And you're mad at this guy, but you go back to this guy. Make up your mind. Yeah. So, obviously, you're not mad. But you know what talks? This. Right. Because he's right. getting this. Correct. So, shut up, Brett. Nice. Sweet. Shut up, Brett. Yeah. That could be used for the dirt sheets. Yeah, makes sense to me. Chris, please tell the fans where they can find your book. And, again, thank you for joining us. You're always such a great conversation, and thank you. Oh, thank you guys. I really appreciate. It. I love, I love listening to you, and I and um, you guys are great. You can get it on Amazon. Order it on Amazon. Um, it's twenty bucks, or you can go to Wisconsin Historical Society Press. Um, but Amazon is probably easier. You probably get it in about a week or so. Yeah. A lot of fun. Uh, we want to, we want to apologize for your Packers, how bad they are. I'm sure you're miserable at this point. <laughs> yeah, wow. You know what? I, I kind of figured you guys, and you know what? They deserve it. But I was going to mention something about, you know, your Jets are doing really good. Your Jets yeah! are doing really good. Yeah! <laughs> Yo, we got to celebrate because you know how this usually goes for us. Yeah. I mean, what is I going know, on but, here? But it was funny because when I remember the first time when I talked to you guys and you said uh, – well, we don't have Joe Namath anymore, anymore so right. it's been hell for the last 50 years. But right. um, that there are, the Packers organization is in like total disarray. And I'm talking about from the general manager to the coach to Rodgers to everything. Do you think <laughs> it's time? Else. Do you think it's time they cut ties with Aaron Rodgers? Because first it was the coach's I, fault. I mean, at what point? I, have... I think so. Oh, wow. I really do. Wow. Interesting. You know, here's the problem with with Wisconsin sports. A, um, a coach or a player, he'll have a one or two, you know, good years. So what do they do? They sign him to the moon. They give him the world. Right. And then the next thing you know, they're losing. And then they're stuck with them. So um, I, I think that they, that they should trade him. Um, the coaching that they do, the, the play calling and stuff – you know, I hate to say it, but I don't, I don't really care anymore. Mm. I really don't. But when I saw your Jets beat the Packers, I was thinking I was thinking of you two guys. It's like, man, you guys are probably smiling, and that's okay. Yeah. You know, you yeah. guys, the, 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 yeah. it, it's nice to see new teams in there. Absolutely. You know? And it, I'll tell you one you, thing, you just real, new, real quick to round this out, new, the, uh, uh, the football. Um, the Jets may not have a Joe Willie. But I got a feeling we might have a few LTs hanging around on our defense, and I'm be. not sure anything else matters. Phil Desiree yeah. says, uh, Chris, it sounds like it's your book is a great read. It is. You're an entertaining guest, and you are, sir, and we love having you on the show, and we're glad to call you as a friend. Thanks for joining us, Chris. Well, thank you, guys. Again, it's been an honor, and I really I really enjoy your show, and, and, and thanks for inviting me. All right. You're welcome. Thanks, brother. Thanks, brother. Thank you. All right. Never fails. Good stuff, right? But did he wrestle a guy with bad teeth and a forked tongue? That's what I want to know. He beat a you know, bear. You know what? I, you know what I like. He beat a bear. You know what I like. Yeah. He 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 respects what he did in the business. Yeah. You could he tell. enjoyed it. Yeah. And he, he considered it a privilege. It, yeah. And uh, yeah, he's very real and he's very uh, yeah. humble about it. Yeah. And he's very likable because he's real. Yeah. He's yeah. not a bullshit artist. I totally agree yeah, with I you. Totally I totally him. agree with that you. That was fantastic. He's always a good. He's always he good. Is? And the book is excellent. I'm telling you people, guys, get it. it. Is. It's a it's a good, easy read. It's, it's, it's a bargain fun. for a 20 spot, too. We read it on the beach that day. Yes, we did. Yeah, it was awesome. Yep. Awesome. Awesome. Yes, we did. I want to remind everybody Sunday, 1 o'clock. Uh, I know it's football time. 
time, but we've got the Godwins in studio. There you go. There and you go. Uh, that should be pretty exciting. That's right? going to be Godwins, nuts. The uh, Godwins, you know, both sitting on a couch. That's going to be and nuts. It's been a while since it's been, uh, since, since Valentine, anybody right? sat on the couch. Yeah, since Valentine, yeah. right? So let's have somebody sit. On again, the couch. we keep going. We, you know, yes, we, we do. had Ken Patera. Yeah. We got the Job Man yeah. in the house, and now we got the Godwins. So you there can't you beat it. There you go. All right, this has been Mike. Oh, we want to thank everybody for joining us again on Thursdays. It's such a privilege and an honor that you guys take your time with us yes. to watch us. So we thank you. Yes, yes. Uh, tremendous, tremendous love thank out you there. And thank uh, you. what do you call it? AEW was in Boston yesterday, right? Oh, was it? I wonder if Phil went to go see oh, his little AEW friend. His little AEW? No, he's like, yeah, I know Cena. He's just Cena, an equal opportunity Cena chance senior, with wrestling. If you Cena could. Sr. About, went. Did he? You know, I got to tell you something. I was thinking this. I know we got to get out of here. Was but he selling his sauce in the parking lot? Cena, here's my senior? question. Do you think John yeah. gets fucking annoyed? Like, yo, what, what are you what? doing? That Cena senior I would be. keeps going to eight. Like, I would be Dad, what are you, doing? What are you doing? Dad. That would be like, you know what? If my father got rest his soul ever showed up and to watch the Mets, I'd be like, what's going on here? Are you feeling all right? Get back to the Bronx where you belong. What are you doing? So, yeah, I'm with you. What are you doing at AEW? You can't see this. Yeah, that's Go saying. home. You just took my line. Did I? Yeah. I'm sorry. All right, we'll see you Sunday for the Godwins. This is Mike Monte. This is the Pharaoh. And until next time, Sunday, where you will see us. Later.